up everybody? So it's been a while since I've done uh, a mix tutorial like this and I wanted to do this one for two main reasons. One, because I wanted to show our impulses in action in more of like a full-on like metal mix scenario because that's my thing. And also because I just really like this song. Growing up I listened to this album a lot and I really always liked the production. Later on I realized that Adam D produced this album and it, Adam D has very Sneep sounding mixes and that's kind of probably why I like this a lot because I like Andy Sneep stuff a lot and his stuff sounds very similar to that. Um, I can tell he probably learned a lot from Andy doing uh, the Kill Switch album with him. And so this is, album has definitely kind of shaped the way I mix in many ways because I listened to it so much growing up. Um, but before we dive into this mix, I just want to say, go on a little diatribe really quick about something that I want to have be clear throughout all the things I do in the future, all the videos, all the mixes I ever do, all the products we release. And that is that I do not believe, Joe and I both, do not believe in magic. There is an objective, quantifiable reason for the way things sound in all scenarios. And I don't really buy into the whole, like, gear being the biggest factor thing at all. Uh, the more and more I've done this, the more and more I realize that when I edit people's performances to be super in time and super in tune and make sure that they actually play the parts right and that their instruments are set up properly, those all are... The, the main key ingredients to getting something to sound good. It's not what preamps you used or like what converters you use. Like no amount of 1073 plus vintage U47 is gonna make a singer sound good who like just can't sing or who is all over the microphone even or even just in a room that's not dead enough. Even if you've got a great singer, all of those things are more important than the gear you use. And that's something that I wanna try to just show people and prove to people uh, that it's it's about the tools, it's about the performance, and it's about consistency. It's not about what converter you used or whatever. And uh, I might get a lot of hate for this, but uh, at the end of the day, they've done a really good job marketing that gear, and a lot of people are really set in their ways, and that's fine. But uh, just so everyone knows, from here to the day I die, there is no magic. This is all real stuff. It's all just using tools to achieve a desired goal. That's it. Nothing special. And the other thing is, there are no secrets. A lot of guys, I feel like, you pay all this money for these cl like creative live classes or whatever, where they've got these these big name guys doing these long tutorials on stuff, and it's like it's like a big secret. It's like, ooh, watch this, and you're gonna unlock all the secrets you know, all the secrets they know, and you're just gonna be able to make your mixes amazing. It's like, no, you know, at the end of the day, like knowing to use how the tools, knowing how to use the tools is one thing, but really, it's just it's hard work, it's practice. It's, there's, it's nothing special. You just gotta like do it a lot. And I, everyone's always looking for a magic bullet, but I'm sorry, there isn't one. That being said, you can learn a lot from videos like this one and uh, just from learning from people who have done this before. And it really helps you skip a lot of the guesswork in terms of like what tools to use in certain scenarios. Um, but that being said, there is no magic and there are no secrets. Uh, take what I give you and practice and you will be great and that's all there is to it so or take not just what i give you what anyone gives you but anyone who knows more than you at your current state knows take that to heart take everyone's advice seriously and just practice so with that being said let's start this fix tutorial all right drums baby here we go drum bus here's what it sounds like on the verse okay so first of all I try to keep this pretty simple with regards to like not using a whole bunch of outboard or like anything stupid like that. I didn't even use my Kemper. I just use Amp Sims. Uh, I use uh, just nothing really crazy. I use Superior Drummer. I'm gonna show you right now. So the bulk majority of the drums in this are just straight up the Avatar kit uh, in Superior Drummer. Uh, I did that because listening to this track made me think of Avatar Kit a lot, and uh, I know a lot of people have it, so I decided I would just do that, and most of the drums are just straight Avatar Kit. The snare drum's not my favorite, none of them really are, but for the purposes of not just going crazy and having it all be like my own samples and all this crap, I just wanted to keep it pretty straightforward and just show you what I could do uh, with pretty simplistic methodology here. So first off, the snare drum is the GMS Near Z Custom got a lot of processing on it, which we'll get to, but the toms are all just the, you know, GMS coded. Uh, for the kick drum, I actually used the kick drum from Metal Machine, the Andy Sneep thing, of course, knowing me. 
Uh, I really, I just really like the kicks in this, and I really, this has more of the kind of like clicky, hyper uh, scooped out sound that the original song has. So I kind of went with that instead of the um, kicks in uh, Avatar Kit. And I also used one more X drum. I used the uh, one of the Chinas in the Metal Machine uh, for the little halftime part during the choruses because I really like the way this China sound. Other than that, this is all just uh, you know, normal, normal kit stuff. I, I, don't, I didn't really mess with anything because uh, it's not a big deal. One thing I did do though is I evened out the cymbal volumes a little bit in the overhead. I actually went in and, uh, I'm sorry, no, not in this. Whoops, I lied. I did it in this. So like this crash cymbal I brought down 2.9 dB. This crash symbol I brought down 2.9 dB. This this I don't know if I even used, but I didn't bring it down. The ride I left up. This was just to even them all out because um, I found that during parts, and this was this one's not down at all, because I found that if you just leave them all at zero, uh, the crashes tend to be a lot louder, especially when you're mixing like different symbols from different kits like I am here. And instead of wanting, having to like compress the overheads later or something stupid, which makes no sense in the context of programmed symbols, really, unless you're trying to go for like a like a vibe thing with the symbols kind of pumping. Um, it makes more sense to just like balance them out since all the hits are, hits all the hits are like the same same volume. So uh, I just went in, you just do it by ear. Uh, it just helps a little bit. It makes your cymbals sit better in the mix so they're not like trying to poke through and blow up your limiter at the end, which is always a problem with uh, anything with a lot of high end in it. So anyway, so after you just set up the kit, oh yeah, 13 inch, whatever. It doesn't, you can do whatever you want, honestly. Um, so then let's start with the kick drum, all right? So with the kick drum, I'll show you what it sounds like without any processing really quick. Uh, it sounds good, and uh, but then I want it to sound, you know, more like what I want it to fit in the mix. So that being said, let's uh, solo out this kick drum really quick and I'll show you what it sounds like. So one thing I wanna say uh, right off the bat is that using the tools like this, like spectrum analyzers and stuff can be incredibly helpful, especially when you just sit and you're mixing and you're like, God, there's a weird resonance somewhere. Or sometimes, you know, you, two elements just aren't, fu you just are fighting, and it's, you might hear, you might have a good idea of what's going on in each individual one, but then when it comes to them all being combined, you ha find a lot of problem areas. So a lot of people are like, uh, mix with your ears, not with your eyes. Absolutely, you know, when you're making EQ adjustments and when you're fitting stuff together, don't look at this, you know, don't look at these, keep these closed. But in terms of seeing what's there and seeing the, possible problem areas where stuff overlaps. Tools like Vox Angle Span or any meter. I like these FFT plugins because you can import other stuff from them and see the spectrums lined up on each other, which is really cool, which I'll show you at some point during this video. So that's what it looks like without anything on it. Now, right off the bat, I know that because bass guitar is gonna kind of live between like 70 to 120 in there, uh, with you know some scooped out at 70 for the kick and I'm not really gonna have any sub bass in the bass These are things that I already know that I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna add a bunch of sub lows to this kick to make it really fat just like the kick in this in the actual song So right off the bat one of my favorite plugins. It's so funny You can do so much ridiculous stuff with this including make guitar DI's almost sound like bass uh, our bass and what this does is essentially adds harmonics down in the low, the sub low, well, wherever you want. In this case, I set it to 40. So I'm gonna turn it on and off and you'll, you'll definitely hear what's going on. So I just did it by ear, but it's kind of funny now looking at it, all the harmonics across the sub lows are now exactly even. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I actually haven't seen that so right now it's kind of funny, but uh, yeah, so that just adds in that sub low and it's gonna help it punch through the mix and seem fat at the end, uh, which is what, again, I was kind of going for here. So then we just got EQ, again, scooping some crap out, boosting some highs, making it really clicky. So making it even more scooped out, again, this is just to help it fit in a full mix context. Um, and again, when making these adjustments, it, it's really helpful to have the bass going. Uh, well, I actually I won't say that. Uh, it, it's good to have your kick drum EQ kind of like done. You kind of want your kick drum sounding the way you want it and make the bass fit with that. Because people have a way bigger 
uh, idea like in their head already about what kick drum is supposed to sound like in a metal context and nobody really like hears bass in turn talking about the average person like they don't like your bass can sound like friggin anything and like as long as it does what it needs to do for the mix like nobody cares so for that reason it's better to make your kick sound dope and then kind of make the bass fit with it uh, but you know, obviously there's some problem areas. Don't make your kick really present at hundred Hertz in a metal mix. Like you're going to have a hard time making bass fit with that, you know, and that's what this is scooping it out at 75 to make more room for the bass. Cause I'm really using the sub low part of the kick to help it punch through and really sound like fat. And that's kind of where it's placed in the mix is. So I don't need as much in this area, make room for more room for the bass guitar. So then I've got compassion. This is actually my side chain. This is so that when the snare drum is playing, it makes it duck out. What's great about Compassion is that it's got a look ahead uh, somewhere in here. Uh, yeah, look ahead, 1.5 millisecond look ahead I'm using. And it also has a hold function, which I'm using, which essentially makes it so that after the compressor looks ahead 1.5 milliseconds and sucks down the kick drum, it holds it that long so that it doesn't like accidentally release too early or anything like that. And it sounds really smooth and makes room so that when the drum bus is hitting the clipper at the end, which I'll get to. Uh, it doesn't just like blow it up and sound bad on snare hits. It makes room for the snare. And if you do it just enough, like one or two dB, I'll show you. It uh, it really can help the snare pop out over the kick, even in songs like this where the kick and the snare are hitting on the same beat and they both have to be really loud. So check it out. So notice those hits where the snare drum and the kick drum hit at the same time. You don't really hear the kick drum ducking out that much, and that's always the goal, is to make it uh, kind of like transparently ducked out because your brain immediately just goes to the snare hit happening. So anyway, that's just a little trick you can do with any really number of compressors that have side chain. The main thing is that they either have a look ahead or they have a true mil zero millisecond attack time. Uh, so I, I, I love DMG audio stuff, as you'll see. Uh, but, you know, that's what that's for. This is just an overall compressor set with a hilariously slow attack time, pretty quick release. Um, and this is mainly just to, this is kind of like the quick and dirty non-automation way to level out kicks during really fast passages. Um, that's all this is. Again, in, in the context of the mix, it helps a lot. And then this, Uh, that's actually nothing. I was like messing around with something. So that, that doesn't do anything. Cool. So overheads, again, nothing crazy. Just, uh, oh yeah, oh, wait, oh okay, first off, yeah. It goes without saying, I use uh, Ver Slate everything. I really like his stuff. He's one of the few people who I really feel like is pushing the industry forward in terms of like using digital technology to not only emulate the analog gear that we we like the the saturation and the sounds of, but also using that technology to push us forward into like a truly fully digital world. Uh, and that's and I'll just say that about that. I use this because I love it, not because I love him. But uh, you know whatever. So I use the Neve setting. The Neve setting on this on the on the channel and the mix bus adds a bit of low end, a bit of like subs and. You know, I always keep it on my drum bus at the beginning, and when, when I, at the end, when I take it off, it always feels really bad. So I just kind of go into it with that. It allows me to really get a little fatness out of everything without without having to EQ in any sub lows, except in the context of like, you know, a kick drum. But it just makes everything kind of sound, you know, a little more smiley face EQ'd, a little warmer and a little brighter. Not warmer, sorry, a little brighter. Warmer, I hate that word. Lamarita, for when you're feeling really fruity. All right, so with these overheads, uh, it's just, you know, a little bit of EQ uh, here and there just to scoop out some harshness where the cymbals were kind of poking me. They were kind of poking out there, and I took that down. And also in here, just to make room for the presence region of the guitar and everything. I want to say something about this uh, particular high-pass curve, uh, or high-pass filter curve. It's called the bezel curve in equilibrium, and it's uh, it's kind of, it's a linear phase curve. This. The plugin is not in linear phase mode or anything. Also, this is it's good to run with this on high if you use this plugin for high end stuff. It's just way cleaner, way less weird sounding. Uh, this keeps the phase accurate so that when you're moving this high pass around the area where the body of the snare drum is, it's it's gonna really 
detract from that body and the overheads in a predictable, consistent way, as opposed to some high-pass filters where they're messing with the phase of it, and because the snare drum and the overheads should be in phase with each other, uh, it can really make it react in non-predictable ways with the rest of the drum, close mics and everything. So that for that reason, I really love uh, the bezel curve on this, although, again, you know, tweak it by ear, but uh, I like things to do things predictably. I, I like to like see what's happening, I like to know what's happening, and I, I, for that reason I really like using that curve on high passes on material that's got other copies of that material somewhere else where phase relationship is important. Okay, cool. So just a bit of EQ, um, and that's it. Again, they're programmed overheads, so you shouldn't have to do much. They should really sit all in the same place. You just kind of have to make that place where you want it to be with EQ, and then it should all just be golden. So a snare again, slate channel, a little bit of EQ. I'm going to turn this off. Oh, yeah, virtual mix rack, by the way. This just came out, so I'll use it for a second so I can show you guys. EQ on this, just a little bit of boost, a little bit of scooping out some mud. I'll show you what it sounds like uh, after I only meet the snare. Again, all this stuff is important in context of the whole mix, but for the purposes of showing you exactly what the EQ does, uh, uh, you know, I, it's really good that I, it's good to show you guys solo it out. Um, and a lot of times you make these adjustments in the mix, uh, most importantly, but it's always good to solo stuff out to hear what's there and to hear what the problem areas are and to get an overall idea of what you might need to boost or cut in the context of the mix. I'm gonna mute the verbs too, really quick. Again, just shaping it a little bit more towards that kind of like, I call it the smiley face EQ curve, the like scooped out mids and everything to make it fit in the mix. Virtual Mix Rack Revival, uh, this plugin just came out, so I didn't get it really get a chance to use uh, the compressor on everything or anything. I'm gonna do another mix soon, I'm gonna use that on everything and hopefully be able to see what it's see what it can do. But I just wanted to try out this Revival plugin, I'll show you what that did on this. Again, pretty, pretty very subtle, but it really helps uh, the high end just kind of like poke out a little bit more and the body of the drum, again, just be a little fatter. Uh, just kind of does, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what this plugin does and that's kind of cool, but uh, thankfully it's very subtle. It doesn't do anything crazy, but what it does do sounds pretty good. So I just use that kind of just to see what it did, honestly. And then from there, I'm using Blue Cat Patchwork to load in uh, Metric Halo Channel Strip, uh, an oldie favorite. And this is just using, I'm just using the compression in this to shape the transient a little bit. That drum doesn't have a lot of pop to me. It's kind of just like this like thwack and the body of the drum is like really loud. Um, and what this does is it kind of separates the attack from the body of the drum a little bit. Again, just helping that poke out a little bit. And then I'm using Decapitator to kind of bring a little bit of that body back, but in a way that's kind of like gritty and nice. Check that out. And if I bump the, the mix all the way to wet, you can hear what I'm mixing in. That really brings out that snare rattle at the end, just kind of like that little bit of like, like spitting, like crack at the beginning. Just helps, you know, edging things closer to where I need them to be. And then a good a favorite, a lot of guys use this, uh, Transex Multi. It's just nice for kind of like exaggerating the transient effect on stuff. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. It depends on the sample. With this sample, I felt like I kind of needed to. And this is really making the transient really bright. Again, pretty small, pretty small changes. I don't, I, it's, try not to do too much with any one thing, although there are definitely some things where I do a lot, and we'll get to that, especially with bass and stuff, good lord. So from there we got, that's the snare top. Snare bottom is really nothing special. 
uh, just a little bit of EQ. Always run these together, snare top and bottom together when you EQ because they're very phase accurate. They should be anyway, and EQ moves will affect them both. So it's really wise to do the EQ moves with both running. Uh, but this again just makes this snare seem a little more open, a little more hollow, uh, less of that mid range kind of like nasaliness generally between like 5 and 1K, 501K. You can get a lot of that boxiness, and I just don't like anything to be boxy ever. Um, that's just kind of, I don't, don't, I don't really think that works in metal mixes too well. Uh, I even was super lazy on this mix, and not super lazy, just, yeah, super, sure, super lazy. And uh, I did all the rack toms on one bus. That bit of uh, saturation just increases the density of the drum a little bit and adds a little bit of nice bright crack to it tiny bit again nothing nothing too crazy here especially with pre-processed drums like this like you shouldn't necessarily have to go nuts I mean they're already pretty heavily processed uh, all the spirit ones are and that's fine you know that's the point they're supposed to sound good out of the box I mean how are you gonna have drums don't sound this good out of the box like they don't sound this good in real life normally you have to do a lot so um that's fine and again just a little bit of I didn't even use compression on a man who cares and I use a little bit just scooping out a little boxiness adding a little bit of 7k just making a little bit of crack nothing too crazy uh, with the floor toms just again decapitator didn't even EQ them because they're only in one part of the song and there's not really much going on uh, hat just again taking out a little 3.3k to make room for the presence of the guitar and everything nothing too nothing too crazy and that's really all it comes down to with the drums and we go to the drum bus Again, uh, the Neve setting on this. Uh, FG Gray, now this is just to add a little bit of like, kind of like vibe to them, I guess you could say. Um, just makes this, and then make some pump with the snare a little bit. I made the high pass at 60 so that the kick doesn't really hit the bus compressor at all. And the snare drum just kind of make everything duck out a little bit and kind of add a little bit of exaggeration to that snare drum. It's again, pretty subtle, I'll show you, but uh, it's definitely there. I'll turn off the other plugins on it so, we, so you can see. do a part that's like not that short it's also adding a little bit of gain there so that's not totally fair To me, it definitely seems like they're more, it makes them seem more like one cohesive unit, and it's, it's such a slight thing, but um, it definitely did what I wanted it to. Uh, and then after that, we've got basically Ozone 6 uh, on um, just using the Harmonic Exciter actually a little bit, and I'll show you what that's, that's doing here. So let's listen just to this presence region first. exaggerate a little bit. It almost adds a little bit of like click to it, almost like a little bit of clipping. Um, and uh, you know, it ended up sounding, it ended up doing its part in the mix for me. Again, none of these things doing too much here. Uh, then I also did it on the presence region just to kind of like smooth out and just kind of like crush the, the harmonics of the high end a little bit. Uh, and that's just to help the cymbals and everything just kind of float around, sound good. Then from there, one of my favorite plugins, Joey Sturgis Clipper, it's just a soft clipper. Um, adding 2.5 dB again, taking out one and a half. So yeah, I am adding a dB again to this, but mostly that's just to get it where I want it to sit level wise. The two and a half dB is to get it so the snares are hitting the limiter or the clipper the way that I wanted them to in conjunction with the mastering limiter. And then this is just kind of like, I adjust the overall kind of level of the drum bus. So the drum bus really only clips, it peaks at like one and a half dB, negative one and a half dB. Again, in this context, not doing an extreme amount with it. None of this is really doing an extreme thing. And again, with with sample drums and virtual drum instruments, you shouldn't have to do too much. That being said, 
Let's go to the drum verbs. First of all, we got the snare room. I'm just using uh, Valhalla room. And I'm using mostly the early reflections. Uh, I use the snare explosive gate preset to start. And then I mess with the reverb mode and everything and all this crap until I got it where I like it. This is mostly using the early reflections to create this kind of like right after it. Check it out. So again, that's just helping add a little like depth and density in terms of sustain to the snare drum where, you know, a really dry snare drum sounds kind of dry and silly. Uh, and that's all that's really doing, not doing much to the late uh, size or anything. Uh, mainly, let's see. Yeah, because not, I'm not sending any of the early reflections to the late part of the reverb. So that's just the way it is. And then I've got another verb. Uh, right here, the drum verb, and that's what everything's going to, and that's just alt verb loading a small hall. This is a free impulse I got based on the Bracasti M7. Uh, you can just search up like M7 impulses, and they're free, and you can load them in whatever loader. I'm just using alt verb 6 for this, and uh, nothing special. I just load them up, and that's what I use for the, the rest of the drums. A little bit of EQ on the snare room. Uh, again, high passing it here. Do I use the bezel curve? No, I didn't this time. I just used that one. Uh, and basically, that's uh, just you know rolling off the lows. I just tweak this while listening to the whole drum kit until it sits right and doesn't uh, muddy up the whole drum sound too much. Um, and then this is just again, I just did this in EQ instead of doing it like in the reverb plugin just to make it seem open and uh, keep the high end from dirtying up the mix too much because the reverb for me is really supposed to just like increase the mid-range density and, and sustain of the drum it's not really to add any like high end or crack or anything because that'll just eat up a lot of room you need in your mix and just a limiter 90 percent of the time it's barely doing anything not doing much same with the drum verb limiter uh not doing much the point is just to make sure it doesn't get crazy during like big tom rolls or anything uh Oh, I typically end up limiting everything a little bit at the end, as tastefully as possible, uh, just because when you're trying to get mixes as loud as you need to in metal mixes, that's just really important. So from there, that's pretty much all there is to drums. Uh, let's go to bass. Now, uh, the bass for this is not entire, is not at all Iceman's track, and I'll tell you why. The part that he played uh, is like 10 times harder than the actual song. The actual song's part is this. That's it, just like eight notes and quarter notes the whole time, and he played basically the guitar part on the bass, which for the purposes of making a metal mix sound good, it's really hard to make bass guitar sound like that unless it's and play that fast, unless it's hyper edited to the point of being like fake, which is fine, but since the real song here doesn't have hard bass part, I thought it was kind of silly to try to like do that. So I just retract the bass, my bro and I retract the bass, and I want to say that the bass we retracted with is the same one we use on Thrash and Burn, and it's like had pretty old strings on it, and we just tracked it with, you know, my $200 interface. No big deal. Not a, you know, ideally, uh, the new strings thing is way more important than the $200 interface thing, like I've said, because uh, the new strings add that really nice, like bright fret buzziness to it. And, but there's kind of a way you can get around not having it a little bit, and I'll show you what I did. So here's our bass tone by itself. With the drums. Cool. So let's go with how I made that bass tone. So I used three tracks for this bass. Um, I used all, they're all the same DI, obviously. Um, and I'll start with the first one. The first one is just with the low end portion. I start with Bass Rider. Uh, I'll ch show you what this sounds like without each thing at every step. Now without Bass Rider.
Now, a little thing, a little little pro tip I want to say about Bass Rider. This this knob, this artifacts knob, is so dope. Uh, I didn't know what this did for a while, and I kind of thought it was like how many. It was like ignore artifacts, and I was like, oh, maybe it's like how many artifacts will are like okay for it to have in the signal from the processing it's doing. Then I was like, that doesn't really make sense because it's just doing level processing. Why would there be artifacts? So I looked it up. And essentially what this does is the bass, it can detect for in terms of the auto leveling, it can detect the level of the bass from either the high end or the low end. And this is really cool when you're splitting the track up to do, do those exact different parts. Because if you have the artifacts knob set to high, it's going to ignore all the high end information of the bass DI, and it's going to only look at the low end, and it's going to keep that as like the level of the bass, which is dope for the low end, because that's what you want. You want the low end of the bass to be like consistent and rock solid and not moving. So on this one, I set it to ignore high completely, right? So that it's riding the low end. On the other tracks, I set it, I tried setting it all the way to low. But because there isn't that much presence in this bass DI, because uh, you know the strings aren't really new uh, or anything, I it ended up sounding a little too weird. It was making it jump around way too much, so I kind of had it halfway. And then in the distorted one, I again halfway. But if you had a bass track that was like really, really played very hard and had new strings, what that would do is it ignores the low end of the of, of the track, which you're going to filter out anyway on these second and third tracks. And it makes it so that the high end portion is what's there. What's cool about that is if you do that and then reamp it through a, a bass pedal or a real bass amp or whatever, it's gonna make it so that all the pick attacks and everything hit the distortion at the same volume, which is gonna make it sound really unrealistically consistent, which is awesome. And because you, you're splitting it up into different tracks, this allows you to do that, which you normally can't do. You can't play a bass DI through an amp and then have it be both consistent with pick attack and low end at the same time. You can only really do that in this scenario where you're breaking it up into multiple parts. So that's just one thing. That's what that knob does. Keep that in mind. It's going to help you a lot in the future. I guarantee it. Once I started doing that, I was like, oh, this is dope. Anyway, so that really helps. Then equilibrium. What this is doing, this is just, uh, you know, I, you know, you end up finagling the exact point on this curve a lot in the course of the whole mix. But what this curve does in general, is you filter out everything above like 200 or somewhere, maybe sometimes it's way lower, sometimes it's higher, it just depends on the rest of the mix. And this is just filtering out all the upper frequencies after Bass Rider. And then from there, I got Fat Compressor, Soft Tube, it's nice, it's kind of like the CLA 76 plugin. It's got a pretty slow attack, pretty fast release, 4 one ratio, and this is just kind of helping level it out a little bit, not doing a ton of gain reduction, check it out. Now, now the virtual mix rack is out, uh, I'm really excited to go back and do this type of processing with uh, the new Slate FET um, compressor, the SSL style one, the one, 116 or whatever, um, because a lot of character and a lot of like nice subtle saturation can come from that, and that's what makes for a good bass tone a lot of time. But for the purpose of this, the CLA76 or this plug will work great, um, and that just helps even it out a little bit. Uh, I've gotten less and less dramatic with my bass compression. I've tried to just be more tasteful and like less ridiculously fast attack times and stuff. And uh, I'm pretty happy with the way that this one turned out. It sounds pretty nice. Uh, and then after that is another EQ and that's just to take out any sub lows. Cause if you notice uh, with this off, there's a ton of sub lows that get, that get bumped up cause of that compression cause of bass rider. So now again, I'm doing this because I need those sub lows and I need that 60 to 70 hertz for the kick drum. So that's what this is for. You know, if there was no kick drum in this mix, you know, I wouldn't do that, but there is. So that's just the name of the game. Next, we've got this second track. Now, this track is not going to sound technically exactly the same as it is in the mix I bounced for the video because what something is messed up with this plugin and uh, it always has been. And when you reload the session, it'll just be like way louder than it was. I, I don't know why, it's kind of annoying. The drive knob stops working the same way. I'm sure many of you use this have had that problem. So when I did the original mix, I froze the track once I got it where I wanted it because I could never get it to be the same way when I opened the track. That being said, this is pretty close to what it was. Um, 
But this is like not quite balanced exactly the same as the final mix that is on the video of this. So I do like this plugin other than the fact that it can't consistently load itself, which is kind of stupid. Uh, and that's essentially the first thing I do. Uh, it's uh, just bass writer again into this, and that sounds like this. And again, that's just to add a little grit to it. Um, just a little bit of exaggerating that pick attack, that click at the beginning, um, adding a little bit of that fret buzz in. Uh, with a bass track that is like really, really played hard and with fresh strings with a lot of nice fret buzz, you might be able to get away with just that. And that's kind of a lot of what the uh, original ATR, the original All That Remains bass track sounds like. It sounds like just like new strings played really hard. Uh, not too much going on. After that, I used Fab Filter Saturn, excuse me, Fab Filter Saturn on smooth amp, something that I've never really done before, 100% mix, and this really like scooped it out and made it sound really nice, and I'll show you. Now, ignore the low end of that because I'm about to I'm about to roll off all that extra crap with this. And then again, limiter. Um, I'm using this limiter just to barely limit it, and then also to just bring it down and level a lot. Uh, you know, why not instead of using like a fader or whatever? Now, if I turn this off, listen to what it does. It really adds a lot of clankiness to it and kind of crushes those upper harmonics a little bit and makes them a little bit more even so that 1K isn't poking out as much uh, and it's more in line with everything else. But I'll, I'll end up EQing a bit of stuff out to make it super smooth, but we'll get to that again. And the third track is a heavily distorted track, and this is kind of my way of uh, making up for the fact that there's no bass distortion, or excuse me, there's uh, old strings and not a lot of fret buzz, so check this out. And again, I'm using Fab Filter Saturn again with a little bit of an uh, envelope. Uh, and this is making it so that the drive is kind of louder on the pick attack. Again, uh, just a little fun thing. Uh, just uh, You can use any number of distortions. I just played with one until I found something I liked. Uh, but anything that just overall helps the uh, just the buzziness and the distorted grindiness mid-range character of the bass that'll help it sit with the guitar better. Um, and then when you're balancing the levels of these compared to everything else, it's helpful to have the guitars pretty much done and going with them to make them really sit right together. And then I'm using Recabinet just to load one of our Ampeg uh, impulses, and I'm using that to sh pre-shape that distorted tone or else it would just be too crazy all over the place, like white noise. Like any hard distortion is going to sound weird without some sort of cabinet impulse. Uh, and then after that, just EQ again, shaving off a lot. Excuse me, shaving off a lot of highs and stuff, and uh, a lot of lows, just to keep it nice and focused where I need it to be. That's with this choir. Notice that limiter isn't even doing anything. It's just like affecting the level of it. And that's fine, you know, L1s and stuff. If, a lot of the times I'll use an L1, the out ceiling, if I'm using an L1 or some sort of limiter at the end of a thing. I'll just use the out ceiling to control where the volume is. And that way, if I do some volume automation on the fader, I can still go back and change the overall like base level of the volume just with that. So that's kind of why I use that, even if it's not doing anything. Uh, and then again, we're going to go to the base bus. And this is where all the magic happens, all the fun, ridiculous crap. So again, 4K adds a tiniest bit of saturation. Uh, it's just I kind of keep it on everything. And then our compressor, I'm going to take each one of these things off. Our compressor, pretty fast attack, pretty fast release, low ratio. Again, just kind of gluing this stuff all together. I play with each of these things until I get it the way, get it the way I like it to sound. Um, opto compression is going to be a little smoother. It's kind of like based off optical circuits where there's literally a light turning on 
and the delay of that light turning on is what creates kind of like the smooth compression that people like. Um, that's why people like on vocals and stuff, because they're smooth. Um, but for this purposes, I was, ended up using the electro setting on warm and not doing a ton of compression. What you're listening for is you want the low end to really be sitting in place. Uh, you don't want it to feel like it's getting really loud and really quiet or just in, in any way jumping around too much. Um, and that's just essentially what this helps accomplish. It does add a bit of gain, so that's not the most fair comparison, but again, that's what it's accomplishing. Now, here's we get into crazy mode. EQ, baby. Craziness. And uh, this seems so ridiculous looking at it, but uh, each of these has a purpose. And a lot of the times with bass with older strings like this, you'll get a lot of weird muddiness going on, and you'll need to, again, this is on, first of all, this is on linear phase mode, really high impulse padding too, so it's just like really, really hyper accurate linear phase. And with the whole mix running a lot of time, I'll do these cuts and listen to the bass drum and the bass by to get by themselves, or together, but just by themselves, and make these tweaks along with the guitar tone and stuff running until nothing is really getting in the way. And this is where things like this can help a lot because we can input the uh, the kick into this now, and if I play the drum bus as well. Notice how in the six, seven, 60 to 70 range, this is way subdued compared to the rest of it, and the kick drum takes over from there, and they both kind of like meet right at here. Again, I didn't EQ those things so that that was true. Like I didn't look at this and then EQ out a little bit until I was like, oh, they're the same now. I went in and was like, okay, they're fighting. They're really overlapping at this frequency during those low Ds. Uh, let's see if I can take a little bit out. And I sat there and tweaked it until they sat against the limiter the way I wanted them to. But now again, looking back at this, they fit together very, very beautifully on the little, little graph. The same can be true for guitars as well. And uh, you know, when you have the guitars go in, you can see the way the bass, the low end overlaps with the guitars and try to make some adjustments from there. And again, this, the, all these were just to take away different harsh resonances for any sorts of reasons, just from the distortion, uh, the nature of the cab impulse, uh, with, the, with the bass, the, the fret buzz on that bass was kind of harsh, like the click of it was very like peaky. It's just the way it was and this is what all this is doing. And this high shelf is just, again, at the end, I kind of like lowered the overall balance of them without adjusting the faders. I kind of adjust the high end balance compared to the low end without having to adjust the faders um, because adjusting the faders will also affect how it hits this compressor and I don't necessarily want it to do that. So with this, uh, let's show you with and without it. A lot of junk in there, uh, and in the mix it would sound really bad. And when they with the CQ, sounds good, and it sits with everything in the context of the mix. The other thing I did a little bit is. Uh, C6, just using a little bit of multi-band on both areas of the low end, barely touching it. And this just helps each of those frequency areas sit where they need to be, and on certain notes, like higher up the neck, it can make these frequency ranges pop out a lot more because the fundamentals of the notes are much higher or lower in some cases, although typically in metal, you're usually riding on the lowest note the entire time. So if there's one note you get right, that's usually it. Uh, but for the higher notes and stuff, it's nice to have this on. And then this one band right here is actually side chained to the toms, and I had the, the upper low end of the bass ducking out when the tom hits were doing it. Now, again, normally you might do that with like automation or just very, very finesse EQing everything, but for the purposes of doing this in not a month, uh, I just did that to help them cut through a little better, and so the toms ring out and sound fat in the mix. Because there also aren't that much tom, there aren't that many tom parts. Um, and that's it for the bass. Pretty much.
straightforward. Oh, well, straightforward enough. And then we've got guitars. Uh, guitars is what are interesting. So on guitars, guitars, uh, again, it would be a little disingenuous for me to say these are exactly his tracks. They are exactly his tracks. I just edited them to shit to make them super consistent. Uh, so like all the digadun, 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 digaduns are the same, you know, all those little things, because that's what it takes. If you listen to the actual stem of this song, uh, it's pretty clearly hyper edited. All metal things are. Uh, sorry, that's the real world. Um, so, uh, but there are his tracks, and you can go download them. And uh, I actually used a, a, a beta test of a 5150 amp sim. Uh, I can't technically say what it is yet, but for the purposes of trying to recreate this tone on your own, X50 is great. It'll get you like 90% there, 95% there. Um, so I'll just say that, but know that it's a 5150 emulation and an X50 will sound pretty much exactly the same. So other than that, I used uh, the 808. Again, just a, no drive, just to flatten out the low end a little bit, tone knob up, just adding a little bit of gain with it. Again, people think this is like magic or something. This is just like an output volume. Like this just adds more gain to the amp. Like I, I, people think this is magic, but it's like not. It's just adding, it's adding a little bit of gain on the input. That's all. I mean. Just so, just so everybody knows. Um, and then I'm using Recabinet to load the impulse, and I'm using uh, our Mesa Rectifier 2 impulse. Again, that was kind of the point of this. It sounds very good. And then I use Slate uh, on the 4K setting, just again to add a little bit of saturation. It's very subtle. And then from there, we go to the real stuff. So with this, I'm gonna show you on this track, we start with C4 on each channel uh, to even out the low. You know what? Let me actually turn off all the bus processing first so you can hear this one step at a time. Now, uh, one other thing I want to mention is that in this song, listening to the original stems, it's pretty clear to me that this is like quad tracked. So, uh, I didn't really try to make this sound exactly like the original mix or anything. Uh, just trying to kind of make it sound good. Uh, that's kind of always the goal, just make it sound good. And uh, so again, this is just the first step, evening out those low mids a bit. And then from there, I did that on both tracks. Uh, this is what they sound like without any... And we start again with Slate, API bus, check this. Again, very subtle saturation. It, it never sounds like that much on one track. That's kind of not the point of it. So don't, don't think that you're like crazy if you don't hear much there. It's not a lot going on with that. Um, and then Gliss EQ, this is a cool EQ. It's kind of like a multiband compressor, but it's just a dynamic EQ, which is, again, very similar to a multiband compressor. Normally this is used to boost stuff, but they have, um, they have a one type of curve that actually takes stuff down. Now, because of his playing and some of the notes, not, some of the chords and stuff not being exactly in tune and some stuff, I got a lot of weird resonances at 700, so I use this to just kind of overall ride that area to keep that down, because if the 700 range gets too forward, uh, it kind of sounds nasally. Sounds like this, and nobody likes that. And uh, when people say they like scoop out guitar tone, the five to one k, the five to eight hundred area is kind of that scoop point, because um, like a lot of the fundamentals and a lot of the meat of the guitar is down from two to five hundred. So if you scoop all that out, your guitars end up having like no balls. They just sound like they just sound like weird and thin, you know. And I noticed the the original guitar tone for this track was insanely scooped, and mine's not even really close to that much. Um, that's fine. Again, I was just trying to make it sound good. So I'll show you how much this is. So again, not doing too much, but on certain notes during the course of the song, it really helps keep that area subdued and not blow up the whole mix. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this because I'll I did this after I'll show you. And then we got EQ. This is where a lot of stuff happens. I'll show you. So right here, 
This EQ curve might look a little crazy to you, like with the bass one, but it's really not. Uh, with guitars, you end up, especially once you get under the magnifying glass of having a limiter going and really like crushing it all down, the high end of the guitars is so present and so bright, you really are gonna need, to make a mix sit well at negative five dB RMS, you're gonna need to use this area of everything very sparingly. And a lot of times I'll just sweep these around to find little gross resonances and just suck them out just enough. It's hard though, because the more you take out of this area, the less present your guitars are, but at the same time, the more clear your drum hits are gonna be, your vocals are gonna sit, everything else. So it's this constant battle. And uh, you know, this is one of the reasons, especially with EQs, I do not believe in presets, because this is so specific to the source material and so specific to everything else that's going on. But I'll show you kind of just some general ideas I was looking for. This 1.2 curve, this is just to take out a little bit to help with the clank of the bass, because that's where the main on the R Ampeg impulse is. It's mostly sitting right above 1K is where that general like mid-range character is. So that's where I cut out a little bit on the guitars. This is just to help a little muddiness in the guitars. These are to, this is to help with uh, like just little resonances that were happening because of just the guitar and the playing and the, the amp and the cab and all these little things. They were just poking out a little too much in the context of this mix and I took them out. But here, listen to listen to a few of these things soloed, each of these bands soloed. <laughs> crazy range here. Notice when I turn that off, watch. That might be hard to hear, not in the context of having it be heavily limited, but in the mix, that's really gonna just push on everything and sound really weird. Same with all these other little bands here. Now, with our impulses, I generally don't need to like low pass them a ton. Uh, I just did a little cut at 5K here uh, to help open up that presence region a little bit, but in general, not too much craziness. I'll show you with and without EQ now. Way more, a little bit more scooped out, way more consistent flat low end, none of that rumble going on thanks to the high pass and all that. Presence region is a little bit subdued and under the context of like heavily limited, um, you're gonna notice that there's way less resonances and stuff. And this is this is hard to learn to do. Um, you just gotta kind of practice with it, but know that it's, it's totally makes sense to cut from the guitar tone. I almost never boost high end or really anything with guitar tone. It's more about taking out the crap that you don't like than it is about boosting what you do. You kind of boost what you do by shaping everything else around it. Now, then I have L2. Why do I have two instances of L2? Mono, that seems so stupid. Well, it's because in Pro Tools, you can do multi-mono plugins where you can have the left and right side be two independent channels of a single plugin. And what that allows you to do is not crush your stereo image. Because if you have a stereo L2 on the guitar bus and the left guitar, hits the limiter, it's gonna reduce the level in the right guitar, even if the right guitar didn't hit the limiter. That's stupid, that's not what you want. You want them to both be lock solid, excuse me. <laughs> you want them both to be rock solid on their independent sides. You want them to stay wide, you want them to stay consistent on their own so they both just sit nice and, and they don't mess with each other because they're independent, you know? You want them to stay wide. If the more the left and right channel are the same, the more narrow the stereo field becomes and the same in every way, dynamically, frequency-wise, everything. So for that reason, I have two L2s, and I'll show you how in Cubase to do this. Essentially, you open this up, and you go to, uh, let's see. Anyway, so here's how you do this. Notice that these this is the first L2, and this is the second L2. I went in the routing editor, and I made it so the first L2 is on the left track, and the second L2 is on the right track, and then they're just the same setting, essentially. Notice, they're the same. One is affecting the left track, one is affecting the right track. Uh, I like to keep it on arc release because if it's too quick, uh, you can end up getting like weird clippiness if the high end hits the limiter. But this is generally just to make sure the lo there's no weird spurious low end peaks of, of grossness that blow up the mix. Again, they're not touching. <laughs> Nothing too crazy. Now, the last thing I did to really help this cut through, 
and I'll show you the full mix going uh, with this on and off to help you see it, is this, again, multiband saturation a little bit. And I did it before the EQ because if I did it after the EQ, it would bring up a lot of that stuff that I had just taken out in those areas that I needed scooped out for the main mix. And if I do it before the EQ, it kind of saturates everything, including all, all the areas I want to have the guitars be present. And then I just take all the extra stuff I already didn't want out, including anything added to it with the EQ. Um, and that's, that's why that was there. And I'm just taking the upper mid range with tape saturation. It's just helping crush those distortion, makes it a little more like squishy, a little more grindy. Uh, just cuts through the mix a little better. So you notice that helps quite a bit, and uh, in the context of everything going here, I'll play it with the bass and everything, and you'll hear. So again, that's it for the guitar bus. Um, the rest of it just comes down to like making sure everything's balanced and level. Last thing I want to touch on is just the vocals really quick. Uh, I used the real vocal stem in this, uh, mainly because I just wanted it kind of as like a point of reference to kind of fit everything around. So for that reason, I didn't really mess with it at all. I didn't EQ it. It's already really compressed and everything. Uh, it was dry though, so I did add some verbs. Uh, here's what it sounds like. No with the onset. My flesh is weakening! Still feel my pressing on me now! No with the- So again, just a little bit of decapitator, just to saturate a little bit, make it a little gritty. Weakening! Still feel my pressing on me now! No with the onset! Nothing crazy. And then a room, uh, I'm using, let's see. For the Vox room, I'm using Valhalla room. Just a very short room, just to add a little bit of space to it. Check it out. Weakening! Still feel like pressing on me now! No with the onset! My flesh is weakening! Still feel like... And then a main, longer verb to kind of like trail off everything, and um, this is more for like the chorus and stuff, but I do it on the whole thing, just for the purposes of not tweaking this to death. Weakening! Still feel... And for that, I'm just using an impulse, uh, uh, a vocal plate impulse. Again, the M7 impulses that are free on the internet. Uh, pretty straightforward. Nothing crazy. That was the point. Didn't want to go crazy. Um, and that's about it. Uh, ignore this snare pop bus. That didn't do anything. I was messing with something. It's not nothing. And then also delay. Again, just you can do whatever you want. Echo Boy, just make sure you always filter your delays out a lot. Uh, again, because I didn't tweak that to death. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but that's about it. Other than the master bus, on the master, I just run, you know, this on it again, whole time. A little bit of master EQ to help it sit right. I use a little mid side EQ here to on the sides only. This is set on just normal mode, by the way, with digital phase plus on, not even linear phase. And I take a little bit of the sides at 1.2k to help kind of like the because that's where the grid of his voice is. So I kind of made everything in the sides move out of the way. So the guitars a little bit, cymbals, everything, just half a dB just to help his voice cut through a little more. A little bit of a presence boost. Again, it says 3 dB, but this is the Poltec high D shelf 3 dB. So it's not really 3 dB. If I know if you if I put this on the DMG high shelf, notice how much it boosts a lot. That's the reason people like high like Poltecs. They think they're boosting a ton and they just sound so great, when in reality, 3 dB on a pull type boost is like a dB. And also, look at how wide this curve is. Like, that's why people like them, because they're super musical. Again, it's not magic, guys. That's about it. Um, this is just a little notch to help those low mids, to kind of help the snare pop through a little more, and just uh, kept the guitars from blowing up the limiter, and just the whole mix in general. Uh, again, I don't like to do too much with my master bus when I'm mastering my own stuff. You shouldn't really need to. Uh, it, it should pretty much sound good, you know? It should pretty much hit the limiter and sound good uh, without any crazy stuff. I think that's a thing a lot of people miss. Uh, you listening to my mix, if you like the way everything's punching through and everything, although the snare's not my favorite, like I said, I'll admit, but uh, everything else sounds good to me. Again, just IRC3 clipping, finagle this until, if it goes too fast, the guitars can clip out a lot. I have transient emphasis on normally. This does a little bit. Don't do this too much, or else it can make the mix pump weird. 
Um, I always keep the output ceiling, if I'm going to bounce this down to an MP3, I always keep the output ceiling about negative 0.4, negative 0.5, because uh, when you convert it to MP3, it, it uses up that headroom. And if you are bounce it with a true zero ceiling, it can it can kind of like make your transients all kind of gross. Uh, now, mind you, if you're already slamming everything with a limiter and it, there's not really any punch to be lost, you're not really going to notice. But in the case of like if your limiter is really nicely balanced and everything's nicely bouncing off it, uh, that can really screw it up and make your mixes just not cut the same way they should. Um, I always have true peak limiting on as well to keep any inner sample peaks from going away. Now, mind you, that bumps up the processing a lot. As you can see, my computer's about to have a heart attack uh, because I'm recording this and doing this at the same time. But uh, I'm not going to play this for you because you can hear it in the other video. But that's about it. Uh, again, hopefully, hopefully you've learned something from this video. I always say that and I always mean it. Uh, stay tuned with us. More products. We're going to release more impulses by the new year. Uh, more different cabs. Um, and just... Uh, Go make cool metal stuff, man, you know? So uh, keep it classy, YouTube. Enjoy.